Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good to see so many familiar faces of uh, young and old making their journey back to their home church. And we're grateful to God to bring you back with us and renew our fellowship with you. We'll take you as much as we can. Please turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Speaking of returning home, it's good to be back from the Philippines to my home church. And the Lord has indeed blessed us. And you can read the official report that was sent out this morning uh, via email when you get an opportunity to. I encourage you to read the entire report. But let's direct our attention to the Word of God and let's pause and ask the Lord to bless the Word of God. Heavenly Father, you are God and you have given us your Word. We pray now that you would open thou our eyes, that we might behold wondrous things out of your law. Change us by and through your law. Make us to be more like Jesus from the hearing and application of it. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Second Timothy chapter 4, I'll read verses 6 through 8. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Finishing the race is the title of this message. I received an email from my good friend, Pastor Downing, yesterday that a mutual longtime friend, Dr. Gabriel Otero, passed away on Saturday. 35 years ago, he hired me at Family Radio School of the Bible. I worked at the school for many years and got to knew, know him really well. I also attended two funerals in the last three days and a number more of them in the last few months where friends and family members passed away in recent months. It seems like more and more we're hearing of deaths, not of distant people, but of people close to us, people we knew, people we loved, friends, co-laborers, saved and unsaved alike. These souls going into eternity have reminded me how fragile and <coughs> unpredictable life is and how important it is for Christians to persevere in the Christian faith until the end of our lives. The brevity of life and the need for perseverance are vivid reminders of the need to finish this Christian race. That's what I want to talk about today. A close friend of mine, many, many years ago, whose family was one of the four founding families of Christ Bible Church, says something <clears throat> profound to me one day. I'll never forget it. And looking back over his life, he, he told me, Joe, I've had many struggles and failures and backslidings throughout my Christian life. I think we can all identify with him, right? But in spite of it all, I want to end well. So the question I ask you is this, will you finish the race? Will you, like my friend Ed Garbarino, end well? Will you persevere into the faith, in the faith, until the end of your life? As Jesus said, he who endures to the end shall be saved. Some of these folks I've referred to did not finish the race. They did not end well and perished in their sins. A few of them, Though they had struggles and fallings away from time to time, in spite of them, faithfully fought the good fight of fate to the very end of their lives after being recovered. 
But my spirit is stirred up. My spirit is stirred up right now. I can't let this issue go. The matter of the need for perseverance, the need for you and I to finish the race. And so far, many of you may have a very good track record. No one of us is perfect. No Christian is perfect. But in spite of that, you may look back on your church attendance, your relationship with the Lord. And generally speaking, you may say, thank God, by His grace, He's kept me faithful. He's kept me in the faith. I haven't denied the Lord Jesus Christ. I've embraced and maintained sound doctrine. I have kept up and assured accounts with the Lord, though I've struggled from time to time. And by God's grace, He's kept me in the faith. But that's up till now. Many, many have fallen away and become reprobate and denied the Lord Jesus Christ after being a professing Christian for 30, 40, 50 or more years. I remember a lady named Ruth. My mother introduced me to her. She had been a missionary to Mexico for about 55, 60 years. Very faithful lady, Christian, missionary, godly woman. She asked me to visit with her. She was a paraplegic, paralyzed from the neck down. She was about 90 years old. And my mother was one of those who took care of her and was a caretaker. And she needed fellowship. She could not get out of the home, go to church and fellowship with other Christians. She found out I was a pastor and asked I'd go over and visit her. I went over and visited with her and at the end of our visit, I was more edified than her. Yet she said, please, Joe, pray for me because one of my physical medical issues is that it's very hard for me to swallow. My saliva dries up and I have to take medication for it. And sometimes I, the, my caretaker forgets to give me the med medication and all like, like night long until the next one comes in the morning, I'm in great pain because I can't swallow and I'm in agony and I, I stay up all night long. She says, Pray for me because at that moment when I'm at my worst, the devil comes and tempts me and says something like, you see Ruth, the Lord's been with you all these years, but now at 90 years old, he has forsaken you. Why don't you curse God and die? She says, please Joe, I want to make it to the end. I want to persevere to the end of my life. I don't want to have to go through all this 75 years as a Christian and then perish in the last days, the last years of my life, denying the Lord, embittered, against him. And we had a great time of prayer. I remember walking out of her mobile home that night, walking down the steps. It was a, a, a full night with stars out. And, and I, was, I was walking down the steps. Tears were rolling down my cheeks, crying like a baby, saying to myself, as a brand new pastor, I have a long way to go. Should God give me long life? What an example. What a profound example profound lesson I just had reinforced. Now, I, I'm a firm believer in the perseverance and preservation of the saints, but I was able to get a picture of, of this woman putting myself in her place that should the Lord give me another 50 years or 55, 60 years at, at that time, that's how much older she was uh, to me, that I'm going to be tempted and tried and put through the fiery furnace of affliction unto my last breath. And so in the light of this, these recent deaths, I've been stirred up. I've been reminded of the weighty issues, the life and death issues. Many of you are just starting out in the Christian faith. You're just in the first decade or two of your walk. It does get more difficult. The race gets harder to run, but where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Amen. He gives more grace as time goes by. As the roadblocks and the physical trials increase, as you discover deeper and greater amounts of the stubbornness of your sin that you never knew before, because God's grace has been heavy on you, suppressing the full knowledge and strength of sin that resides in us that can be a spoil in our walk with God. But God gives grace. And, and enough grace to be compatible with the pressure and the strength of sin and the increased 
battle against sin in our lives. So, I'm concerned for professing believers who never understood the need to run the race nor had the urgency to do so. I see a massive amount of professing Christians who are very indifferent to this war that we are in, to this race that we are in, to make it unto the very end, to endure to the end and be saved. I'm concerned for true Christians who have become complacent. Older Christians. I have found myself in the last couple of years exhorting those of, among our own congregation and others where I have occasion to preach at different places in the world where I see more gray hair among those in my audience. And I exhort them because I know one of the biggest temptations is for older Christians, those who have been in the faith 20 years and up, to settle into a passive, indifferent, complacent lifestyle when it comes to spiritual responsibilities, spiritual disciplines of the Christian faith. And those of you who are older in the faith, remember what the Lord says, that he who endures to the end shall be saved. You cannot leave it to the younger brethren in the Lord to do all the evangelism, to do all the discipleship, to do all the good works, to have all the zeal, to have all the jealousy for the glory and the truth of God and His Word. You must set the example. That's what Scripture says in the epistles of Paul. You older men be and older women be the example to the younger. <clears throat> I'm concerned for believers who become discouraged and depressed for a long time and can't get out of this fog of depression that they're in. For some reason, they, they refuse to lay hold the grace that is available to them in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they just continue on in this rut and this cycle, this pattern of lukewarmness when they don't have to. I'm concerned about those who have been distracted by the world and the cares of this life and, and are spiritually asleep. <clears throat> Let me give you a little bit of background with that introduction to our text in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Timothy was not only a preacher, but he was a soldier, a Christian soldier, who would have to endure afflictions. Paul told him in, in verse 5, endure afflictions as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Timothy had seen Paul go through sufferings on more than one occasion. And most of Timothy's sufferings would be, like Paul's, from the religious crowd that did not want to hear the truth. It was the same religious crowd that crucified Christ and that persecuted Paul and arrested Paul. In our text, Paul indicates that he was about to leave this world and go to his heavenly reward. And in doing so, Paul presents three different aspects, three different outlooks, of his soon death. First, Paul looked around at him in verse 6. He looked around. He said, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul realized at that time, the time he had left was short. He was on trial in Rome, but Paul knew that the end was near. However, he didn't tremble at the prospect of death. The two words in verse 6, offered and departure, tell us of his faith and confidence. He looked around at him. He was to be brought before Caesar to give a defense of the faith and to bear witness of the truth to the head of the Western world. But Paul tells us of his faith and of his confidence. The word offered here in verse 6 means poured out on the altar as a drink offering. In effect, Paul was saying, Caesar is not going to kill me. I willingly give up my life as a sacrifice to the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. I have been a living sacrifice all this time. As he exhorted the church in Rome that we should be living sacrifices. He had been serving Christ since the day he was saved. And now... He says, I will complete that sacrifice by laying down my life for him. Now in verse 6, the word departure 
is a beautiful word that has many meanings. I don't have the time to get into all of them, but it means basically to hoist an anchor and set sail. He's about to set sail and cross over that river into the heavenly kingdom. So the word departure is, means to hoist anchor and sail. Paul looked on his soon death as a release from the moorings of the world, an opportunity to set sail into eternity. The word also means to take down a tent. And this word parallels a similar word in 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 8, where Paul compared the death of believers to the taking down of a tent or a tabernacle. He says, when I put off this my tent, my tabernacle. In other words, when I depart, when he has his departure from this world in order to receive a permanent glorified body, a permanent tabernacle, a house not made with hands, a glorified body. And we're all of us on that journey. I see some of us getting older. Look, I look back at Brother Carney. I was just rejoicing in our brother's gifts a little while ago and how he's been here for 27 years at Christ Bible Church. And I knew him when he was middle-aged. But now he's an old man. And I'm almost his age, so I can say that. He's, he's 70. He's over 70. And so for those of you who are in his and my category, in the 60s and up, we're, we're sailing and we can see the horizon. It's, 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 it's coming up soon. And we can rejoice, as Paul, was, Paul here rejoiced. So, but Paul not only looked around at him and his soon departure and the circumstances leading up to it, but secondly, Paul looked back. He looked back. Look at verse 7. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. In this verse, he's summing up his life and ministry. Oh, that all of us on our deathbed with perhaps hours or days to live, we can look back like Paul said here and say, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. But it is now that you need to be laying the groundwork of that clear conscience and that good testimony that you and I hope to have on our deathbed as we see hours, maybe days left in our lives. Now's the time we need to be laying down that track record where, generally speaking, we can look back and say as Paul, I have, Lord. I can look you in the eye, Lord, and say, by your grace, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. By your grace, I have kept the faith. Oh, what a priceless gift that God would give us as his children to be able to say that in verse 7 as Paul does. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've completed the race. I've accomplished. I've crossed the, the finish line. I ran cross country in high school my last year to get in shape for Marine Corps boot camp in 1973. The only reason why I went out for cross country and everybody on the team knew it was because I was preparing for Marine Corps boot camp where they had, I was told by my recruiter, they have to run three miles every day with their boots on. So I wanted to get into shape. And I either came in last or next to last in every single race. I wasn't trying necessarily to come in first. I was just trying to finish the race. I was trying to build up my endurance when I ran cross country. So I could cross that finish line. And there were times when I came in last that I was huffing and puffing and I was in a slow jog. Slow jog. And there were both teams, the competitor and, and my home team, both teams cheering me on, cheering me on just to cross that finish line. But I have to say, by God's grace, as, as the season wore on, the last several races, I didn't come in last. I either came in next to last or third to last. So I did build up some endurance. And by God's grace, I got better and better at it. And so it is with the Christian life. We need to just do everything we can to cross that finish line. But we aim in our training to come in first. We aim high. We aim for the bullseye every single time. The two images here in verse 7 are athletic. The image is that of a determined wrestler or boxer who had fought a good fight, 
and like a runner, he had finished his lifelong race victoriously. He had kept the rules of the race and deserved the prize. The third image is that of a steward who had faithfully guarded his boss's deposit, that the, the stewardship of what his boss left to him to not only guard, but to gain profit and interest. He said, I have kept the faith. And Paul used this image often in his pastoral letters. It's heartening to be able to look back and have no regrets. Paul was not always popular, nor was he usually comfortable, nor was he perfect. But he remained faithful to the end, and that's what really counted. Thirdly, by way of exposition of the text, Paul looked ahead. He looked at the present. He looked back. And in verse 8, Paul looked ahead. He said, finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, that righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Look forward to that day when he would get that crown crown of righteousness. Some of you are struggling hard with sin. Some of you have trials and temptations right now that are very painful. But you need to face those trials and that pain. Face it and deal with it by the grace of God that is found in Jesus Christ. Because we have a ways to go. We have a way to go. If God would give you many more years. A Greek or a Roman athlete who was a winner of a race was rewarded and usually got a laurel wreath or a garland of oak leaves, unlike some of our modern day athletes that get $10 million a year, $20 million a year, or more. <coughs> However, Paul would not be given a fading crown of leaves. Those leaves would wear away, wear out, wither up. His reward would be a crown of righteousness that would never fade away. That reward we will have forever in heaven. We have that to look forward to, like Paul talks about here. Because the Lord says, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Now in your trials and in your depression and in your suffering, it's difficult sometimes to rejoice in that reward that God has laid up for all those who love his appearing in the future. But you need to by faith believe what God wrote to us here as a means of encouragement and comfort to us. The Lord Jesus Christ gave this to us. Whether or not you feel like rejoicing in that future reward, it is yours already. He purchased it on the cross at Calvary in his death. The crown of righteousness is God's gift of salvation by imputing the righteousness of Jesus Christ to, not only to Paul's account, but to the accounts of all who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. So our incentive for being faithful and for living holy lives is the promise of the Lord's appearing. In many places this is called the blessed hope, the hope that when the Lord Jesus Christ appears from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the heavens are rolled up as a scroll, and God calls up his people to himself, we will not be able to say goodbye to anybody. We will drop what is in our hands and what is going on, and we will be caught up with the Lord in the air at that moment. And we will be able to rejoice in that blessed hope, the Lord Jesus, who will come and who will, who will cleanse us from all sin, who will give us a glorified and perfected spirit, a perfected spirit that will now be compatible with our glorified body so that we can be, we can be worshipers of the Lord and in fellowship with Him on His level forever and ever. Because Paul loved Christ's appearing and looked for it, he lived a godly life of obedience and served God faithfully. As it were, Paul would say, no, I can't do that. No, I can't go there. 
because I'm looking for my Lord to come and deliver me from this present age with all the pleasures of sin in it. This is why Paul used the return of the Lord Jesus as, the, as a basis for some of the admonitions in, in this chapter. In, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, for example, 2 Timothy 4, 1, the apostle uses the second coming as a motivation for holiness in the present tense. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, and so forth. <clears throat> and so the soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ is indeed an inspiration for us not only to live holy lives, but to be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor is not in the in vain in the Lord. Whether we're preaching the word or serving the Lord in whatever gift and capacity he has given us as members of his holy church. And it's an honor and a privilege to be a member of a true biblical church of Christ that we might run the race set before us alongside of our brothers and sisters edifying one another, serving Jesus Christ in the church. But that brings us to the first point, beginning the race. Sometimes so many professing Christians have a false start. They never seem to get out of the gate, to never begin the race. The Christian life is often compared to athletic games or a war. For example, Paul compared it to warfare in 2 Timothy 2.3. He compared the Christian life to boxing in 1 Corinthians 9.26, to farming in 2 Timothy 2.6, to a building under construction in 1 Corinthians 3.10. And, as our text teaches, to running in a race. There are many other texts, which I'll go into a few of them later on, that use running a race as a metaphor for the perseverance of the saints. One of the most important qualities that a long-distance runner needs is endurance. Without endurance, he will not come in first, nor will he even complete the race. And he uses that metaphor deliberately and comparatively to the Christian life. You and I need endurance. There's so much ignorance and indifference about holiness and perseverance in the church today. In the New Testament, the Christian life, as I said, is depicted as a race. In his writings, Paul uses the metaphor of the Olympics and athletics to describe the Christian life. But we see in the Bible that as we run the race as Christians, the race requires discipline. Most American Christians are undisciplined. Undisciplined and therefore we lack and suffer need in the area of assurance, in the area of joy, in the area of love, is because simply and sadly and tragically we are not disciplined. The failure is not on the part of the promises of God and God's perhaps reluctance to pour out His grace upon us. No, God is willing and enthusiastic and desirous to pour out uh, and renew His grace upon us on a daily basis. But very often it is simply because we don't use the means of grace in a consistent, disciplined way. In his writings, like I said, Paul uses the metaphor of a runner, of a, an athlete who is disciplined. In three epistles, Paul used the image of all-out racing to urge vigorous pursuit of spiritual growth and service. Four times, Paul spoke of his own growth and service in terms of being in a race himself to the gifted but immature believers in Corinth, Paul wrote, do you not know that in a race all runners run but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize or to come in first place. Now everyone who runs the race to actually come in first place, every single one of them is engaging to the fullest limit of their muscles and their organs. They're running to come in first place. That depicts 
imagery of discipline. Discipline. Here in this text where he talks about running in a way to get the prize in 1 Corinthians 9.24, Paul compares the discipline necessary for spiritual growth to an Olympic athlete's effort to win the prize that awaits only the winner of the race. And so growing in the grace and knowledge of God does not happen on its own. It doesn't occur by osmosis. Passively. God certainly is the one who works in you to will and to do of His good pleasure. That is the side of this equation that speaks to the sovereignty of God. God's power must work in us. Without God, we cannot discipline ourselves. But the believer is exhorted in the scriptures to make a serious and disciplined effort himself or herself to follow what the Holy Spirit teaches. And what does he teach? In 2 Timothy 2.5, he says, Anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. You and I as Christians must be disciplined spiritually and compete in this race according to the spiritual rules that God gives us. Therefore, in this race, in this war, according to the rules, for you and I to finish the race, there is no room, there is no allowance for complacency, passivity, or indifference. You must not just read your Bibles. Bible reading is not what the command teaches. You must read your Bible the way God wants you to read it, in a meditative way where the Word of God penetrates your spirit to the a joining, joining asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. You must hide the Word of God in your heart. In other words, you must get the Word of God deep into your minds and your heart. And the Spirit of God, as we read in 1 Corinthians 2, must apply the Word to your spirit, to your heart, and to your mind to change you, to change you. That's the kind of reading, that's the kind of use of the means of grace, whether it be reading, meditation, prayer, fellowship, that we are to discipline ourselves by. These are the kinds of applications of the rules that enable us to be spiritually disciplined so that we can actually grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that our hunger for Christ, our longing and craving for Him is deepened and expanded. So our actual transformation into the image and glory of Christ takes place, and that there are more consistent times of the staying power and residual effect of the glory of Christ upon the new man in us occurs. And so we must begin this race. Those of you who have become Christians, but you even haven't, you've been in the faith five, ten years, and you haven't even read your Bible through once, or half of it once. And you, when someone says prayer in the Spirit, you have no idea what they're talking about. You need to discipline yourself. You need to begin the race. How are you going to finish the race if you don't even begin? Like me, all right? If you began the race, but you find yourself coming in last place all the time, look to the Lord Jesus Christ for more grace to grow and excel and mature in the faith through spiritual discipline. Secondly, our text talks about running the race, not just beginning the race, but actually running the race. The spiritual life is like a race, but multitudes don't even know a race exists. You go into some churches, and you look at the lifestyles of some of these dear, dear people, and you would never know that they're Christians. You don't see a difference in their life. Some are merely jogging, or they're, they're not even jogging, they're laying on this velvet pillow and they think they're going to go to heaven on beds of ease. Some are just walking and many more are just sitting in the, in the bleachers as, as spectators watching the true Christians battle and war and run the race. So few believers run with patience the race that is set before us. Most pursue comforts of this life, money, learning, popularity, respect, 
position the lust of the flesh or anything except the disciplined will of God for our lives. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate or disciplined in all things. Now they do it, that is, earthly athletes, to obtain a perishable crown. But we, for an imperishable crown, stop there. In other words, if those earthly athletes will sacrifice their entire life, all their money, all their time, to discipline themselves, to run some earthly races, wherein eventually their bodies will wear out because of age and they won't be able to race anymore. Pro football, the, the lifespan of a pro football player, I know Hishimu could tell, tell us this is what, three to five years? He himself is counted among the number that has basically no tendons and no cartilage in his knees because he was a professional football player for several years. How much discipline did you have to exert in training camp? I mean, you watch everything you eat, you're running, they have specialized, customized exercises, weight training, every muscle in your body needs to conform to uh, this pattern whereby you can compete for what, three to five years? And then you may get a trophy? You may come in first place in your division or in, or in the Super Bowl or whatever it is, how much more, he's saying in verse 26, how much more we who are competing for an imperishable crown, a trophy, a crown, a reward that we will have forever. Do we long to hear those words and be given that reward from the Lord? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And whatever that reward is, it is, it is imperishable. <coughs> It's not a matter of choosing Christ or so-called believing in the Lord Jesus Christ or saying this formulaic prayer and getting your fire insurance and having some false sense of security that this Christian worker is giving you who tells you Jesus is now your Lord and it really doesn't, or your Savior, but it really doesn't matter how you live for Him from now on. It, it's your choice whether or not you live a disciplined Christian life. And you lay your life down on the altar of service and sacrifice, giving your all to Him. Therefore, glorifying God both in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Some, some are, many are told in our churches that you have the option of, of living a disciplined Christian life and bearing fruit that would redound to His glory. Nonsense! My Bible teaches without holiness no man shall see the Lord. Unless you're running a race and living a disciplined life and bearing fruit from that. That you don't, you're not basing your observation about the state of your own soul according to the clear teachings of the New Testament on the doctrine of sanctification. What sanctification is. The New Testament describes sanctification. Everyone who is justified has the same Spirit of God in them to prod them and move them forward in their sanctification. Justification and sanctification are inseparable. And the New Testament describes sanctification as a path or a race in which all who are partakers and participants exercise constant spiritual discipline. They take the kingdom of heaven by violence and by force. They're, and even when they do all of this, they're scarcely saved. And therefore, from the beginning of the race to the end of the race, though they may backslide and fall from time to time, they exert every ounce of strength, not only to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and their neighbor as their self, 
but with the help of God, by His grace, to exert every ounce of strength to cross the finish line and persevere as a Christian day by day. And so running the race means, as we pick it up in verse 26, therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Paul says, I don't have some ambiguous, unclear picture and understanding of this race that I'm in. The rules, he says, are very clear. The description of the Christian life is powerfully clear. It is a disciplined race in which we must use every single effort, opportunity, gift, skill, and all the grace we can get from God to cross that finish line. Many of our forefathers died at the stake, mm -hmm. exhaled their last breath on their deathbed as men or women that were completely and totally, physically, intellectually, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually exhausted because they had exerted every ounce of strength they could possibly muster with God's help to cross the finish line. I don't know how some of these people are doing it. They, they must have bad theology. They must have a bad gospel which convinces them that they can pick or choose whether or not to run the race. They have the option of making Christ their Lord besides their Savior. But he says, he says, I don't run with uncertainty. He says, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. Not as one who's wasting his time. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Mm -hmm. Now Paul here uses himself as an example. Because it's more incumbent upon him to live a disciplined Christian life than other Christians because he's to be an example. So he beats up his body. Are you doing the same thing? Beating up your body. It's not easy. Running the race means growing from tests and trials. Growing from tests and trials. Those profound, painful tests of your motives that God brings forth in your life from time to time, those severe trials that seek you out and find you, though you didn't do anything wrong, to, at least in your own opinion, prompt such trials. Are you perceiving them? Is your perspective on those trials and tests from the Lord, are you benefiting from them because your, your understanding of them is proper? Are you remembering those painful and profound lessons from those trials and tests that you certainly are impacted with on the day of it? And you say to yourself, I'm not going to forget this one for a long time. Lord, thank you for reminding me of, of this area of my life that has not been under the surrender of your perfect will. Are you remembering those after a week or two? Or have you forgotten them? Will God have to bring you through the same test, the same trial again? Because you're not learning the lessons He wants you to learn permanently. Some of the biggest mistakes I've ever made in my Christian life, the most important mistakes, was on this very point of not remembering that very deep and profound, painful lesson that God taught me to modify and improve my Christian character. I forgot after a month or after a year. And I didn't change as God wanted me to change and improve and grow from that original lesson. We're running a race. Therefore, verse uh, Hebrews 12.1 says, Therefore, Well, let me back up. The true believer demonstrates the reality of God's work in his heart by enduring all sorts of tests in the development of 
Christ's likeness within us. The believer is in training. Sometimes we forget that you and I are in training, constant training. We never graduate from the school of Christ in this area of God training our character, training our behavior, not just helping us to accumulate more theology placed on top of a, of a very large stack of, of doctrinal truths that we've accumulated. But we're talking about Christian character now in running the race. And, the, and we're in training to have our character improve. Much as an Olympic athlete, athlete must train for years for a race. Many of those athletes in the past Olympics trained for six, seven, eight, ten years. And it only took some of them 60 seconds to run a hundred yard dash. Can you imagine that training? Ten years to qualify for the final 100 yard, 100 meter dash in the Olympics. Huge investment of energy, time, and pain. And it's all over in 60 seconds. Well, look at your life. You and I are in training for what? Approximately 70 years? And most of you didn't get saved until you were in your 20s or 30s. And if you add another 30, 40, 50 years to that, so you die when you're 70, that means you're only in training for 30, 40, 50 years to improve your Christian character. You're only in training to improve your Christian character for such a short period of time compared to, well, eternity. Eternity. Therefore, compared to eternity, you're being trained for a very, very short period of time. And you and I need to use that very short period of time of sanctified training as much as we can. We need to esteem and value our time in training to run the race so that we can finish the race. No pain, no gain. It's not in the Bible, but the truth of that is in the Bible. That's why the writer of the Hebrews exhorted in Hebrews 12 verse 1, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us what? He brings up the language of running a race. Let us run with endurance. The what? The race that is set before us. Looking unto who? Jesus. Because I get discouraged often in this race. I stumble, I fall, I lose some ground. Sometimes as Christians we revert back to babyhood and we forget those things which we've learned and we backslide and we lose that sharp, that razor's edge of Christian, the, 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 the knowledge of the Lord, the immediate close presence and knowledge of the Lord when we, that we experience when we've been walking with Christ consistently for a, a, an extended period of time. And when we stop walking with the Lord, that fresh, recent, razor's edge knowledge of Christ in our hearts and minds diminishes. And we grope around trying to reach for that memory of what it was like to know the love of God, the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. And also our knowledge of doctrine diminishes greatly when we revert back to babyhood and we stop becoming disciplined Christian athletes in the word, in prayer, renewing and refreshing ourselves in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, which he died on the cross to dispense into our hearts daily through faith in him to sanctify us, to sanctify us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher. There's the promise. The promise of completion. The promise that we will cross the finish line. He's the author and the finisher. He will get us over that finish line. Amen. You may be like me, coming in last on that cross-country race. But I tell you what, I'd rather come in last, 
going into heaven's door and the Lord says, Joe, close the door behind you, they're not going in at all. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Jesus is lifted up and portrayed to us in Hebrews 12, 1, 2, 3, as the finest runner, the one who set the pace for us in the race. Usually in those Olympic races, they run four times around the track, or eight times, or 12 times, or 16 times. And there's always some runner. He could be the slowest runner among the whole time. But he'll bust out from the, from the start, and he'll take the lead, and he'll set the pace for all 12 circles around the track. He'll set the pace for 11 times, and then he runs out of strength and drops out and comes in last. But he set the pace. The Lord Jesus is the one who sets the pace. He's the example for us. When you and I fall back to second or to third in that race or to last like me, the Lord tells us, look to Jesus. He set the pace. He knows what it's like to suffer weakness in his body. Look to him. Trust in him for fresh grace. Fresh grace. Ask him. Believe him for fresh grace to help you get through one more day closer to the finish line. One more day closer to the finish line. One more day. Pace yourself by looking at the one who set the example, who, who set the pace for us. He's the one who endured every temptation and trial set his way. As a runner in the games must keep his eyes on the finish line. Keep his eyes at the one who's at the head of the pack and keep up with him if he hopes to win the race and catch up to the leader of the race if he hopes to eventually pass the leader and come in first place. So we must keep our eyes on Christ, not on ourselves. Look away from yourself. Keep your eyes on Christ. Keep your eyes and your memory on the war reward He promised for us when you're in the fiery furnace of affliction and testing. Running the race is a, is a life of renewed faith. When you take your eyes off of Christ. Some believers in Galatia had lost faith in God's grace and were returning to a legalistic, performance-based religion. Paul wrote strong words to them. He said, you ran well. Here again, language of a race. You ran well. What hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. You see, the true Christian life can be lived only by faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in the pure word of God. And faith in the finished work of our Lord Jesus on the cross. Trusting our own works only insults God and does us no good. Athletes in a race were surrounded by rows and rows of spectators. The image of the Colosseum comes to mind. Pictured for us as a great cloud of witnesses. The witnesses of the believer's race are listed in the previous chapter of Hebrews, in chapter 11, from the text we read just a little while ago. The men and women of God whose faithful lives were recorded in the Old Testament. These saints persevered despite unimaginable oppression and cruelty we read about in Hebrews 11 and were commended for their faithfulness. Their unyielding faith, however small that faith may have been, their unyielding faith bears witness to the promises of Jesus Christ urging us to follow their example and run with perseverance the race marked out for us in Hebrews 12, 1. Running the race means also persevering in sound doctrine. But I'm going to skip over to the final point, finishing the race. 
finishing the race. I've said this a thousand times. Some of you know what I'm about to say. It's not how you start the race that matters. It's how you finish. So in your mind, you're running the race, not with the mindset of starting out. You don't run with the mindset of starting out. You run with the mindset of finishing. Your mind is at the end of the race, and you're always judging yourself by where you are now with the Lord, based on if the Lord should give you 70 years, three score and 10, or by reason of strength, a little more, between where you are with the Lord now and where you will be at 70 or 80 years old when he will call you home. That enables us to be more patient because we say to ourselves, well, if I'm 62 right now, which I am, and the Lord gives me eight or seven and a half I'll be 63 in a couple of months. So if he gives me six plus more years, I've got to make it for six and a half more years. I, if I fall out now, my 42 years as a Christian means nothing, or as a professing Christian means nothing. I have six and a half years to go. So between now and six and a half years, I've got to run with the mindset, okay, take one day at a time. I just got to get through today. Because I have six and a half years ago. Whatever trial comes my way, I cannot get so overwhelmed with grief and with emotion and with despair and with discouragement that I want to walk away from my life. I want to walk away from my relationships. I want to just give up. I want to go back. I want to move to some obscure, anonymous place where I can just start all over again as a person. And this Christian life is too hard. Nobody can live like this, like this athlete you're talking about. It's, it's too taxing upon every capacity, capacity of my being. You got to pace yourself. Take it one day at a time. You got six and a half years to go, Joe. You can't be thinking like that, like you want to give up now. You can't take it anymore. Yeah, in your flesh you can't take it anymore, but you can take it. You can even grow from it and have a positive attitude in the trial and the fiery furnace of, of affliction if you look to Christ. If you take your eyes off of your depression, your trial, and realize that in that moment of overwhelming, seemingly unbearable pain and affliction, that Christ is there with you, but you are not in tune with the weighty spiritual principle of the moment, which is you need to get your focus and your attention off the overwhelming pain you're feeling at that moment. And this, this spirit of wanting to give up. And you need to get it on the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to fix your attention and your faith on Christ. And you need to cry to Him like a baby. Instead of wallowing and crying in your self-pity and in your pain like a baby, cry out to Him. Cast your care upon Him and He shall sustain you. We read in Psalm 55. How many times have you said, Lord, I can't take it on anymore? Well, here you are, right? Here you are. How did you get from then to now? How did you get from there to here? When did your hope become renewed after you said that in your heart? I can't take it anymore. To help you to just go one more day. Go back to church, crack open your Bible, start reading again, and start praying. But how did you get from the grace of God? So somehow God got your mind back on Him. And that's the secret. Faith in Christ. Faith in Christ. Finish the race. It's not that how you start that matters, it's how you finish. This applies to both your individual relationship with God and your ministry. Some of you are doing well in your relationship with God. But you, don't even, you feel like you don't have enough time for ministry. You don't have enough, uh, enough inspiration to serve and to sacrifice. You're all for Christ and for people. Fulfill your ministry. That's what Paul said to <clears throat> Timothy. Be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. I want to be a, a, like David who said in Psalm 71, Lord... Lord, I, I, I allow me in my old age. I pray this all the time now. 
About six months ago, I read Psalm 71, and I have not departed from going back constantly to Psalm 71. Because now that I'm 60, I'm getting all these gray hair, these gray hairs, and I'm seeing, I'm seeing my death approaching. I'm saying, Lord, let me not depart from this world until I have served this generation and fulfilled my ministry. And some of you say, why, Pastor Joe, why are you going like gangbusters all the time? Don't you realize what your health problems? You almost died twice in the last two years. And you don't even have 100% of your strength back yet from two and a half years ago when you first had your first pulmonary embolism. Well, with the strength God gives me, I want to serve Him with all my heart. I want to run the race in my relationship with God. I want to finish that race. Plus, I want to finish my ministerial race that I'm in to bear as much fruit for the glory of God as I can. Don't look at me. Look at your own relationship with God. Are you running the race in serving God? Are you serving Him? Are you using your gift? Or are you a Sunday Christian? You have a good testimony, you witness once in a while, but are you running the race? Are you drawing upon all the grace of God to live up to all your roles and relationships and responsibilities God gives you as, your, as a Christian, as someone who has gifts to serve in the church, as someone who must spend and be spent for the Lord, as someone who's commanded in Romans to be zealous for God with all your heart and resources? Are you pauperizing yourself in every way, not just financially? Like my mentor, Pastor Shelton, who, who was the founder of Chapel Library, who literally pauperized himself for the glory of God. Are you giving your all because the Lord Jesus Christ laid down his life, the creator of heaven and earth, our own individual creator who made you and me. He gave up his life. He came down from heaven's glory. He emptied himself of his majesty and, his, and, and the praise of angels who couldn't even look on him. He was so holy as they praised him. And he came down into this world, born in human flesh, born of a woman, experience the trials and tribulations we do and we experience in the flesh except sin. He was torn apart, as it were, in his spirit, in his emotions. He had the sins of his people laid on him, and beginning perhaps in the Garden of Gethsemane. And even before that, the griefs and the trials he endured, the physical things he went through, which he deserved none of it. He voluntarily and willingly experienced all that. In submission to the will of the Father because he loved his children so much. He set his face like flint to go to Jerusalem. We have to finish the race. And Christianity is not a nine to five occupation. You cannot be a true Christian within the confines of a short period of time. True Christianity, as depicted in running a race, demands more, a lot more than you and I have to give in every way and on every level. But God fills up what is lacking in us. So that we can barely, barely do everything we need to do to give him our all. We need to finish the race. Fulfill your ministry. Timothy's ministry would not be exactly like Paul's, but it would be important to the cause of Christ. No ministry from God is small or unimportant. A young preacher once complained to Charles Spurgeon, the famous British preacher of the 1800s. That he did not have as big a church as, as, uh, as Spurgeon had. Spurgeon said to him, well, how many people do you preach to? Spurgeon said, oh, about a hundred. Solemnly, Spurgeon said, that, that's enough to give an account on Judgment Day. The point is, it's not the bigness, the largeness of your ministry. It's to be faithful in it to God. We don't measure the fulfillment of a ministry on the basis of statistics or on what people see. 
Faithfulness is what's important. And God sees the heart. He sees our hearts. And this was why Timothy had to be sober in all things. And carry on his ministry with seriousness of purpose. The word sober occurs many times in Paul's letters. And he uses it here in a ministerial way when it comes to exhorting Timothy to run the race. When it comes to serving God. Serving God. Some of us have served God for years. I have counseled a handful of believers over the last month who have, who have said to me, Pastor Joe, I remember the times when I served God back then, 10 years ago, when I was doing this, doing that, doing the other thing. I spoke with someone yesterday, yesterday that I've known for almost 30 years who, had, who has not been in running the race when it comes to serving God. And he said to me, it's been 10, 15 years since I was serving the God, being faithful and witnessing and doing good works and all of these kinds of things mm -hmm. and getting joy out of it. And he's hoping to get back to that place. You see how that can happen to any one of us very subtly, very deceptively. We need to run the race in every responsibility God gives us. We need to run with patience. Don't give up. Don't give up. We often forget we're in a race, and it's a race that we must finish. Finishing the race is everything. It's everything. And we finish the race through the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 12.1 was written to encourage and challenge believers to persevere in their faith, especially in the midst of trials and persecution. And so the race then is the Christian life. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. And we're called to stay the course and remain faithful to the end. Paul used this same imagery near the end of his life. He said, I fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith. Plus the steadfastness of the Old Testament witnesses speaks to believers today of the rewards of staying in the race and of never giving up. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal, the apostle says, for the prize. Again, using the imagery of a race. For the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Forget the past. God is a God of 10,000 chances. Start afresh right now. By going to the Lord Jesus and embracing Him by faith. Embracing His forgiveness. Embracing Him and His love. Embracing Him and His restorative, renewing grace and power. When someone runs a marathon, it is like no other race. A strenuous test of fitness and endurance. Similarly, the race before us as Christians, and we are Christians, no matter how insurmountable we may perceive the future of this race, we are Christians and by faith we go on the course and we trust God for future grace to help us run the race, whatever trial comes our way. But the race we run requires faith and stamina, commitment and resilience and discipline in order to live faithfully. Because the race that's set before us, we didn't select the course. God did. It's God who established this race. And we run this race for Christ. And we trust Christ for the grace to be able to run it and finish it. And we stay the course in spite of the trials and tribulations. And as we run, like I said, we must fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Because He perfectly finished the race. He is the focus of our attention and our faith and he will enable us to finish the race and we look away from all the distractions because he is already at the finish line he already finished the race he secured the victory for us and so in the Christian race everyone who pays the price of vigilant training can win by the grace of God. We're not, we can win in a way of abundance. 
There are many who are saved so as by fire, who just barely get over the finish line, and that's okay. But that's, I don't, I don't know if you want to take that chance of stepping back or not a notch or two in terms of your intensity and your commitment and your dedication and think that, okay, I'll come as close to the edge of that success failure line as I can and just barely fall over the finish line. I don't know if that's the attitude you want to have. No. The attitude in approaching this race is you need to go full out every single day. Full out for the Lord. We're not competing against each other as in athletic games, but against the struggles both physical and spiritual of this life that stand in the way of reaching and so by God's grace, may we be diligent in our race. May we keep our eyes on the goal. And may we, like Paul, finish strongly. And be able to say as him, Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Mm -hmm. Have you started running the race yet? Maybe you're not saved and you haven't even started. Oh, put your trust in Christ to save your never-dying soul. And you will begin a journey, yes, a race and a war. But he will give you grace to finish. Are you persevering in this race, Christian? Are you getting anxious, weary, and tired? Are you, are you trying to fast forward? Are you, are you trying to outsmart the Lord and... and Jump ahead several years and say, Lord, I don't, I don't know if I can do this. Don't try to outthink God. He gives us our supply day by day, what we need to finish the race. But are you pacing yourself with patience? Or do you, or do you go through a, a sprint every week or every, every two weeks or once a month? You go through this sprint, you burn out, you get so discouraged. You have everything come crashing down on you in terms of the discouragements and the trials. And then you burn out. You go through a month or two of backsliding with no grace or no strength. And then you start all over again. you got to pace yourself and get grace for each day. And be consistent by receiving the grace of God. Don't get discouraged in running. Don't slow down. Don't let the enemy lie to you and think, well, I can take a break. I can just have some R&R. &R. I can slow down and I can take a vacation from the disciplined Christian life. Remember, once you embrace such thinking, the devil comes with the next suggestion that to, to extend that slowdown and that vacation another week, another month, another year, another decade. Don't listen to it. Don't fall off track. Paul said, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus Christ. Finish the race of your individual relationship with God and your ministry. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. So, and so after he had patiently endured, he received the promise. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. And, and lastly, Paul said in Philippians 3.13, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Thank God for His grace was brought us this far in the Christian life. And He who began a good work in us will perform it, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. 
The Lord Jesus Christ is the answer to our need of endurance and patience and finishing the race. Whatever situation you're in, I don't know, but He is the answer. He's the solution. Look to Him. Trust in Him. Believe His promises. Trust and believe and wait for the answer until He pours out His grace upon you. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for allowing us to be runners in your race, to be athletes in this Olympics, this enterprise called the Christian life. We pray, whatever our situation is, that you would please give us grace we need. For those who are lost and are being prepared to run the race, please save them. Those who are running the race, whether they are discouraged or depressed or on the sidelines or in the bleachers watching on but not engaged in the race, Lord, help all to get back on that path running the marathon looking unto Jesus and trusting in Him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.